something out from this because you can never have enough fundamentals. How I explain fundamentals and why you are here is because whether you're a pro or a student, the fundamental is a constantly eroding platform. And what that means is, if you are out of practice, what are people saying? Oh, I'm rusty in drawing. I haven't drawn in so long. So that means you've lost muscle memory skills. you lost processing skills, thinking skills. So you take another class, right? And you reinforce that foundation. So that's why you're here, because you can learn new things again or reinforce that foundation that you already established. That is why you cannot stop doing this practice again. These five shapes are the core forms that we are going to build with. And we'll come back to this and explain exactly how we'll use it. Um, before we actually kind of begin, the tools that we actually use in class are going to be a couple of main things. So we particularly use tone, paper. Right now I'm using uh, just a white background. Tone paper is a really good uh, application. Then we also use felt tip pens. Now here's the thing. If all of you right now were in my class with me at Art Center, other schools, uh, I limit the tool sets. Pencil, ballpoint are not allowed in my class. All right, so you're not allowed to draw with them. And the reason why is this. What causes hesitation in your drawing? Incompetence, your mind work, right? You're trying to find, discover things. So when you draw a shape, how do people draw? They draw like this. They're trying to find that form. And it becomes so much on searching, you're not really considering your line. So we're going to build a couple of things. First is the sense of line confidence with the muscle memory skills. <coughs> So we're gonna to go to the basic of the basics. Now some of this stuff might feel like, yeah, hey, it's you know, kind of we're just drawing lines and shapes. So it doesn't really feel visually compelling. But to me, this stuff that we're gonna talk about uh, is some of the most important aspects of what we do in the industry. Now as I draw, I'll kind of talk about a bit of the history as to what I've done. But let's talk about then exercises. Let me see some other brushes too, because this one is a little bit Now, like I said, I've been teaching for 10 years consecutively at multiple schools in Pasadena, LA, and now I've been drawing, uh, not drawing, but also teaching globally, all around the world, using this process. Um, <clears throat> for me, I've found that all these basics and fundamentals have always been applied to everything I've worked on, and I've worked in almost every field of the industry. I started out in concept art and video games, and I've been there for seven years in studios. I've worked in fashion, did eyewear design for five years out in Paris and Italy. I've done illustration and gallery work, gallery shows all around LA. I've also now done my own graphic novel for this year, first time. I've also now taught all around the world, so everything in terms of those communicational aspects, this process has been applied to all of those areas. So if you are presented the problem of a sketch, a drawing, a design, a product, this basically is a communication skill. We are not here to really learn how to draw. Given time, you guys can actually spend years, right? And you'll draw endlessly, and you'll get better, naturally. If you guys ask me a question, how many hours should I draw in a day? Some people say eight, nine hours, two, three hours, doesn't matter. I mean, for me personally, varies dramatically. But if you were to draw 10 hours every single day, would you get good? Absolutely. But will you burn out? Absolutely. And you'll hit that wall so hard that you will have the loss of interest in just drawing in general. So what has happened? You burn out, you take a break, and you don't draw for weeks, and you come back into it, oh, I feel rested. Right? So it's a constant back and forth, back and forth. So really then what this class is about is the mindset. I want to talk a lot about this, how you think about drawing, how you then perceive the world, and how we can use skills like this to then communicate much more efficiently. So whatever industry that you guys are interested in, storyboarding, animation, games, comics, industrial design, you can apply this method of thinking and communication. So the first exercise is the control of your tool. Felt tip pens are the main ones we use. So we gotta be able to build a strong muscle memory. So the main exercise that we begin with is just a line. Now how do we start that line? Well, on this vertical, <clears throat> these are gonna be our starting points. And we'll do several vertical lines. This is a big kind of canvas. I'm gonna work my way down here. Don't worry about line perfection, if it's wavy, if it's heavy. Right now, we're focusing on just building the memory of it. So if you're expecting yourself to execute these exercises of lines perfectly right now, you've already failed, okay? So think more about learning through it and building your mileage. The first exercise of line, the second based on arc, we're gonna talk about ellipses afterwards and we're gonna go into the detail parts. 
I'll do a couple of these demos of basics, and then we'll draw you in something a bit more detailed to show you the application. If I then draw something with much more information, detail, surfacing, render, I can show you right here. But it starts off with just this. Can you just even control your pen? Can you actually control your line? This is not an easy exercise, but it's also very monotonous, very tedious, but you have to stick with it. The first thing is, we're going to draw a horizontal line as it comes out in parallels from this vertical. Let's just do three or four. Okay, they can be shorter lines, they can be a couple inches in length. You can go full page if you want to on your sketchbook. Vary it up. The longer the line, the more difficult. The shorter the line, easier to control, but they're different applications. On a piece of paper that you have right now, if this is your spiral, here's your vertical, you might be doing short, medium, and long lines right now. Okay? Now here's the thing. I've done horizontal lines, and there are things to consider. First, are your lines parallel? Some of your lines might be doing this. Okay. Consider that stuff, because there's further application that will be applied to this later on. Patching being one of them. So on top of this, you think, okay, this is easy enough. What do we do on top of these particular lines now? We're gonna build muscle memory through repetition. So another key word is repetition. Constant movement. So on top of these same lines, we are gonna go on top of them eight to 10 times over without breaking them. So as you can see, the line weight is building. It's getting heavier and thicker. But if you're getting something like this, obviously your control is not there. Now, what is the importance of an exercise like this one? If you were to draw shapes, let's say like boxes, obviously line economy and line confidence has to be there. So, straight lines need to be controlled. Some of you guys are searching for your box and you're doing this, right? You're looking for it. You're trying to find your perspective. You're trying to find your construction. Not as proficient, not as efficient in terms of communication. Doesn't mean one is better than the other, but it is about communication. Here is straight lines. Like I said, consider what you're looking for within the execution. And we do several of them. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What's the pace? What's the speed? Move slow and pace up, all right? If you move too quick, what happens? You lose control. If you move too slow, you jitter, you shake your minds. This is the basics in 101 of just controlling your minds. Now, straight lines feel fine, you know, in terms of control, but we're also gonna now arc our lines. We're gonna make it more difficult as we go. Let's go another vertical here. And we're gonna do a third set. Waves. Now, I'm just doing three or four examples and you are gonna go on top of these eight to 10 times over with the control, which is precision, pacing, thinking through and making sure you control your muscle memory. How am I actually drawing? My hand is placed on the iPad and I'm sliding along my wrist, all right? Elbow is lifted, moving at the shoulder, sliding along it, all right? That's how I control the distances from the pen for pressure. Way much more difficult to control. Can this exercise be then transferred over to digital? Yes, you can. So right now, as I'm doing it on the iPad, the experience of doing the exercise on paper has now direct application to the digital. So again, I'm not treating it any differently. I treat this like a piece of paper. We have three sets of a basic exercise. Line, arc, and wave. We're gonna move on to the other exercises now too, because I'm gonna go into more advanced applications of this at the end period of this. If anybody has any confusions, questions, please, anytime, raise your hand. I have a question. Yes. How often do you practice this? Okay, so the question was, how often should I or should you practice this? At the moment, at places at the school, at Art Center, typically they'd be practicing this every single moment they do homework. So before you actually do design something, create something for yourself, do a drawing and a sketchbook, this is the best way to warm up. Because if you have a blank piece of paper in front of you, it's scary. I don't want to mess up that drawing, right? That perfectionism mindset comes up. Warm up a practice like this, even if it's only five to 10 minutes, that's more than enough. Now let's say you committed more time to actually commit to these exercises on a full page, it can be a couple hours. So in the beginning, really establish and hammer away hard at this exercise, and over time, make it just an everyday practice, every single day, five, 10 minutes. Question about drawing, again, going back to that, should I draw 10 hours every day? 
the idea is, are you drawing every day? It doesn't matter how long. It could be one hour, five hours, ten hours, but are you drawing every single day? And for me, I do draw every single day. But I might not draw for hours upon end. Today, I've only drawn one piece at the table. Maybe it was like half an hour. So would I feel bad that I didn't spend hours drawing things? I don't, because the mental aspect of it is inconsistent. I'm always thinking about it in the process. So keep that in mind as to how you approach the drawing skills. Basic lines. Let's do ellipses next. And from the ellipses, we're going to go into a few more uh, extra advanced elements. Let's just set up a couple of bars, varying scale. They can be thinner, they can be thicker, doesn't really matter. And on a piece of paper, on your sketchbook, you can take that and split them all up, right? Freehand, whatever the case is, small little version, you're just taking a note. Just give it a try. We are going to now draw ellipses and circles. Now, these five core forms are three-dimensional shapes. Of course, the sphere needs volume, shadow, light to show volume there, but we're just going to draw them two-dimensionally. Circles, ellipses. Now, the reason why we're practicing on these two exercises, the line, arc, and wave are there to construct geoforms. The circular structure can be applied towards objects that we look at, rounded forms. Okay? So these are the two base exercises you really hit hard. Anybody read the Scott Robertson book, How to Draw? Yeah? It's pretty tough, isn't it? Very technical. Would I recommend that to people in the very beginning? No. Okay? Because, for one, it's so technical, as awesome as Scott is, and he was an instructor of mine, you sit there and try to read a couple chapters, have you ever actually stayed up and gone through the entire book before falling asleep? I mean, I've actually gone through maybe a chapter or two, I was like, I can't handle this anymore. It's just too technical. Now, for someone who hasn't had the basics, it just goes right over your head. But there's one aspect that he covers, which is right here, the circles and ellipses. And what he says in this is a certain exercise to do, which is draw the circle and draw the best you can with one stroke. Now, again, Scott is an amazing artist, draftsman, designer, teacher. But I don't agree with him on this part, mainly because I'm trying to find a connection between these two, repetition, movement. All right, so I'm building muscle memory. Here, I'm drawing lines over, over, over again. My hand eventually becomes so good at that second nature, I don't even have to look at the line. My movement is consistent. The circle and the ellipse, I'm trying to find that same approach. So here, the first thing is, we ghost the line. Ghost the shape. What that means is you move in that direction of the ellipse or the circle without drawing it. Get familiar with the motion. As you become familiar, we start to slightly draw it in. And we then use a method that we call true up because the ellipse and the circle are going to be off, they're oblong. So we have to correct it, refine it, to be as close as possible. Now if you want a perfect circle, use ellipse guides, use things on Procreate, right? But we're doing everything freehand. So we're just gonna get it good enough. I don't expect you guys to draw a perfect circle. You're not machines, but we'll get it close as possible. So here, ghosting, lightly placing it in, and I use a lot of lines to draw in the circle. As you notice, overlapping, repeating, going over it several times. This is not about how clean the circle is. This is about accuracy. This is about line clarity, the exercise beforehand. So don't worry if your lines are really dense and overlap and rotation. Go heavier in the beginning, if anything else, really heavy. And then slowly start to lessen the rotation and get more clean. So more rotation, less rotation. You can do this with ellipses as well. Turn them in a degree, heavy rotation, lesser, lesser, and eventually it becomes a single or two strokes. So again, in the very beginning, if you're looking for a perfect ellipse of circles, it's not gonna happen. Let that part go. And in drawing, if you already feel anxious just doing these, you can imagine doing a full-scale illustration or piece, that kind of burden can destroy the enjoyment of drawing. And I've had people that have been experienced, the students that come in at the young age of 18, and they look at drawing as something that is an enemy, okay? They're so scared of it. And the anxiety of drawing, you have to be able to let go. Because if you can't even enjoy it, as you did as your kid, for me, when I draw, it's as easy as talking. I treat it the same way when I was young. So I don't look at drawing as something that I have to overcome. It's something of a partnership. I don't fight it. When I was younger, the piece that I was working on, the piece of paper, the pen, the iPad right here, wasn't an enemy. 
I was fighting it. And the more I fought, the more stress was accumulated, and the more anxiety was built. Stress in it affects everything else. Health, relationships, evil, right? It kills your drive. But if you can stay with this as a partnership because you enjoy the process of doing it, the final result doesn't matter. Here's another thing I say to the students. I don't care what your drawing looks like at the end result because it can always be made better. I am interested in how you began. What's your mindset? How did you start? What were your thought processes? If your thinking is clear from the very beginning, then your process will be more sound and the end result can always be going to be better. So let go of the end piece. Be attentive to the present. Don't worry about the practices of the past. You're growing. So if you stay right here, right now, that experience you'll maintain. And you'll then have a longer drive and energy. I can go for hours drawing and talking. I never feel stressed about it, which is why I never hit a wall. Ten years now teaching, I have never been burned out. I've never hit a point where I'm like, I don't know what to draw. I never woke up thinking, I can't draw it. I've never had those thoughts. And if you have, you have to change that mindset. Do it now, because you're not going to do it tomorrow. Let's do some more ellipses. Let's put one line right in the middle. Let's just connect these. Just practicing muscle movement. As I go other directions, speed is something of experimentation. Move faster, move slower. Find your comfort zone. Let's start to actually build something. Basic exercises. So from this, we're going to start to build some shapes. We might not detail it, we might not render it, but we can actually construct something that looks like something, right? So let's say obvious stuff that people like to enjoy drawing, things like animals or creatures, possibly even hard surface stuff. Some of you guys might draw in cars or weapons, armor sets, architecture, whatever the case is. Uh, let's draw some maybe some basic animals first. And then we're going to go into the side of hatching and render value and we'll then plug in more information on top of the surface. All right? Again, if anybody has any comments or questions, raise your hand. Let's go to the next step then. Let's actually build structure here. Uh, let's go into a shape. Let's see something like. Let's say this one. And based on that silhouette, you might think it's a bird. But there are a couple of things here that are not working. I've drawn you some basic forms, circle triangle, maybe a box. You have a center line that's there inside there too. But what we're lacking at the moment is a sense of three dimensions, volume. Now we're not rendering, we're not patching right now, but I want to be able to communicate a sense of volume to you guys. And we're going to do this at a very basic level. The next step before we get into actually detailing this drawing is that I want to communicate three dimensions to you. So how do we do this? Let's take this sense of a sphere and we're going to go through the idea of shape manipulation. And I'm going to start to alter that form a little bit. Maybe I kind of stretch it out this direction. Maybe I kind of press and pull this way. Um, elongate it and get these kind of weird, random, blobby forms. But as you notice, I'm either pulling or pushing into that shape. It's still two-dimensional. And I want to create three dimensions. So how we're going to do this I'm going to shrink this down just a little bit. We're going to think about the use of a line. This is our center line. And this center line can S-curve, C-curve, it can spiral, it can be straight. And this center line, imagine and visualize, how about like a snake? Okay, we can draw a snake in there. Just real quickly, here's a snake head. And that snake has a vertebrae that goes through that body form. Now, of course, that gives you a sense of direction and flow. We can control things like proportion with center lines, too. But, of course, the snake has additional structural information in the skeleton, the rib cage, right? So inside, we have then lines wrapping around the body, which gives you a sense of structure. So around these center lines, we are going to draw ellipses wrapping around it. That is going to be our cross contour. So in any one of these objects, as I have a center line from head to tail, 
we can wrap a cross contour around that structure. So even in this bird, as I have a center line, I can now start to wrap a three dimensions of wireframe around it. Now you understand that this beak is a rounded form. So much like building 3D programs, right? we're building a wireframe. But there are problems that can rise up. And I'm going to move to a new layer. I'm going to save these out so that later on maybe somebody can have access to it. If we get shapes that look like this, okay? And the problem is, I might have a center line going this way. I'm going to say, this is the head, that's the tail. What do I do with these forms that are being pulled out? Imagine in nature, we have a piece of bamboo. And that bamboo can grow in multiple different directions with branches. And we have leaf structures, and we have additional branches going this way. Think of even things of human form or animals. We have the main core, torso. We have a limb structure. We then have fingers. They're branching in multiple different directions. So from this primary center line, I can branch it into secondaries and thirds. So as a cross contour wraps around these shapes, it can then follow the central line that branches in a different direction. Okay. So if I had then an animal that has a lot of limbs and forms, you can branch it in different directions, all right? Let's go back to that bird, and let's redraw it now with full construction. I'm going to draw one of the lines. So here's the cross contour, here's the center lines. The hornbill has a nice crest on the top of its head. Here's a silhouette as it wraps around the center line again. There's a draw through in the cross contour that gives you three dimensions. You can have a little bit of extra fleshy material on your throat. Now I'm going to draw elements of details of anatomy structure, things like eyes, maybe it's got the separation of the bill, the feathering. But underneath it, it was the simplest shape that I can construct. At the end of this work, or, uh, talk, I'm going to give you guys a five-step formula on how to draw in this process. Let's place in some more details. Here's where the eye kind of fits. Get to the nostril. We start to see serrations inside the bill. We've got multiple layers. We might have feathering in the silhouette. Wrinkles in the skin. And of course, using references can be very helpful. Observing in real life is a necessary next step, and we'll talk about that very soon. Here's a quick head study with detail, but not rendering, okay? We're not actually considering light and shadow right now. But I built it with the simplest form, and I redid it again with the details on top. Repetition. Repeat the drawings again. When you guys have a base structure, should you detail that drawing? No. Repeat it over, because you want to solidify your visual memory. So the next thing we're building right now from muscle memory is a visual library, all right? So a depth of memory of shapes, proportions, details of subject matter you're studying from. And by repeating it, hopefully it locks it in. Yes, question? Uh, so the Separate drawing. And you repeat every single step. Now you can scale things up like I just did right there, but maybe you keep it to the same size. By scaling it, you have different movements in muscle memory. So the drawings are not the same. It requires different motions. So here's the weird thing. I don't. But on paper, I do. This is the one difference in digital to paper that I don't have. I don't rotate the canvas here for you. Now here's the reason why. It's because I'm presenting it to you. And if I did this constantly, you'd be busy, okay? <laughs> so I'm doing that on purpose for communication purposes. But on paper, I rotate constantly, and you're welcome to do so. I'm just being considerate to the presentation. So I've learned to draw without rotating. So I actually move myself around this. I don't move the canvas. So in Photoshop, I don't use a rotation canvas. Cintiq, I don't rotate it either. Procreate, I don't rotate anything. So when I communicate like this, I stay square, and I'm able to move with the gesture, with the muscle memory that I built up over time. All right? Again, we've detailed the bird, but we have not rendered it. 
Consider the fact that in an hour and a half, I can't explain every single bit of process about, well, what's the bird's details? How do you get to the feathers? How do you get all those little small wrinkles and everything? Experience be a factor. Observation is a key thing, too. But here are the necessary steps. Going back real quickly, line, ellipse, exercise, building shapes in 3D, random abstract organic forms, center lines, cross contour them. Branching directions, choose it, find the direction, wrap around the center line. From there, repeat. Observation, looking at real subject matter, drawing from them, and your goal is not to draw what you see. If you were in my class, I'd tell people you are not a camera. Do not copy your reference, do not copy observation. Interpretation, you filter it. As you filter it, you're filtering what are the shapes, what's the surfacing, where's the light, where's the shadow. You're organizing all that information. Your job then is to organize that information for me, be efficient, to communicate, to visually record that stuff that you can use later on. Does that make sense?